Hello, today I'm going to be talking about The Machine Stops by E.M. Forster. This was first published in 1909 um, and it has some striking similarities to the world of today. This is set in a future where everybody lives underground in this great machine. In the machine, everybody lives in their own one person pod. Um, and it's the pod that provides for them entirely. Like it brings them food, um, their, their bed rises up from the floor, so does a bathtub. Uh, and there's really no reason to leave your pod, but you know, you could in theory, but why would you want to? Um, you spend all day teleconferencing with other people around the world um, where you lecture to them and they lecture to you. You're building your ideas upon older ideas about all of like the knowledge of humanity. This short story starts um, with a woman who is very happily going about life in her pod, giving lectures and whatnot, um, when she gets a, a call from her son, a biological son, they obviously didn't, you know, grow up together, he wasn't like nurtured in any way, um, but yeah, his son, who, which, who lives on the other side of the earth, wants her to come visit, um, because he has something really important to tell her. So Kuno, her son, is very eccentric, and um, he wants to see the world like above ground. Um, this is quite like a taboo, strange thing to want to do. Um, but he really like, really is itching to, to see the world and also kind of has this sense that the machine is kind of breaking down, like things aren't working as they should work. And the way um, to escape this is, is to, to get above ground. And as you may be able to tell from the title, yeah, things don't go well for the machine. I'm gonna put this down, my wrist is hurting. <laughs> I read this story about six years ago and um, I had a video on it then, but that's kind of rubbish. This is this is now the canonical <laughs> video about the machine stops. Um, and I was prompted to reread it uh, this month because someone commented on that old video saying, wait, is this literally now? And um, yeah, it kind of is because everyone in there is, they're in their own little pods, but they, they, can, they can talk to each other via video chat. And that is like an acceptable level of human communication. And we've sort of been forced into the same thing. Back in Forster's time, obviously there was no such thing. So very prophetic. Um, but I think this story really does have a lot of learnings for our lives at the moment about this, this simulacrum we have through um, this like digital connection to people, which some people, um, myself included often, like find completely adequate in terms of their connection with other people. Um, and some people really, really don't and, and crave touch um, and crave, crave just like interaction that doesn't involve this sort of digital situation. And that's why I think this book is a love letter to freedom. We're supposed to so strongly align with Kuno's um, desire for, for nature, for space, um, to not be cooped up, to have like proper interactions with people. And in that way, it really reminded me of um, the climax of Brave New World. I just want to read a, uh, a little bit. Our main man is, is talking to a guy in charge about um, kind of like wanting to not be part of this system. But I like the conveniences. We don't, said the controller. We prefer to do things comfortably but I don't want comfort. I want God, I want poetry, I want real danger, I want freedom, I want goodness, I want sin. And that's what this, like the machine is is, is coddling all of these people and in um, very obvious ways is giving them what they need, even when it comes to like human communication, but there's no risk, there's no uh, vitality in it. And that's what's missing for Kuno, it's that vitality. And that's what's missing for all of us at the moment and why this book really resonates um, is that we, we need vitality. I'm personally very content with life right now. I'm quite happy sitting in my flat and working on my computer. But then when I suddenly think, what have I spent the last three months doing? And I look back on all of the highlights of my life, all of the highlights of my life are uh, traveling to, to weird and wonderful places and being around people I love. And even if I'm content in the moment, that does not mean I'm fulfilled. So I wanna read a little bit in here about the machine. Um, so this is Kuno talking to his mum. Cannot you see, cannot all you lecturers see, that it is we that are dying, and that down there the only thing that really lives is the machine. We created the machine to do our will, but we cannot make it do our will now. It has robbed us of the sense of space and of the sense of touch. It has blurred every human relation and narrowed down love to a carnal act. It has paralysed our bodies and our wills, and now it compels us to worship it. 
A machine develops, but not on our lines. A machine proceeds, but not on our goals. We only exist as the blood that courses through its arteries, and if it could work without us, it would let us die. Um, is that not true of every single system? I think it's analogous to, to countries, to party politics, um, to like even the camaraderie between neighbours, like it becomes a thing that is greater than you and actually sort of has the control, even if that control isn't a single person or a single machine. It makes me think about um, when I reviewed Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. One of his big points was that um, we think that we've been in control the whole time of human progress, but actually we've been really limited by, um, by like geography. And one of the huge points he makes is that um, like, agrarian culture, um, like having a society that's based in kind of like small groups of people um, to farm land, is really like a consequence of like how the land needs to be farmed, not of the people choosing to do it that way. So I think no matter what the system is, there's always going to be this conflict of like, we set ourselves up around this thing, and now that thing has, has control that we don't necessarily want it to have, but we are still getting advantages from it being a system. And there's no definitive measure of when that's a benevolent system, um, like democracy, or whether that's um, a malevolent system, like the machine. Uh, and I don't have anywhere else to go from here on that topic, but I just want to sit with that for a moment. Just like with the last important thing I was talking about, I'm just gonna wrap that up there and move on to something else. So cultural homogeneity. Um, in this, I'm gonna find you another quote, um, which is that. Few traveled in these days, for, thanks to the advance of science, the earth was exactly alike all over. Rapid intercourse from which the previous civilization had hoped so much had ended by defeating itself. What was the good of going to Pekin when it was just like Shrewsbury? Why return to Shrewsbury when it would be just like Pekin? Man seldom moved their bodies, all unrest was concentrated in the soul. Um, ooh, moving bit at the end there. Um, I don't want that. <laughs> like, it's, it's simple and it's neat and it's very convenient if we all speak the same languages, but it's boring if there's nothing else. There's, there needs to be diversity of opinion and diversity of background and diversity of culture. Um, this really brings to mind when I did a trip around the Middle East. I was being driven to the airport in a man in Jordan um, and there were just like giant signs for like coca-cola and mcdonald's everywhere and it was like wow i could just i could be in america and it was really strange that whole trip going into like the the souks uh, all of the like old markets where they sell spice and being like wow this is really interesting and then going to the big shopping malls and being like oh you just want to be like the us and that's just not interesting to me. Like I travel to experience a different culture. Um, and if we all just became one homogenous blob, that would be boring as hell. One final point I want to make about this, we've really gone to a lot of places in this video, um, is just like the fragility of systems. It's something I worry about daily. Um, I, I'm a web developer, I'm a computer programmer, and I'm, just so aware that all of the systems on which we run our lives um, are uh, like a ramshackled thing that we've just built on top of and it has downtime and there's like nothing stopping there just being a bug in Google and then it all exploding. Like even, even like a downtime for five minutes on certain services will bring like the world to a halt. Maybe not permanently, but um, I think it's very easy when you're not uh, technical where you don't work in technology um, to kind of like assume that everything's really stable. Maybe this is true of all industries. Like I think banking, for example, like the financial industry is just like built on some communal promises. Um, and, but I think with, with, with technology, it is very much like someone wrote some code and that code could go wrong. Um, I was listening to an interesting thing. What was it? Um, it was about Y2K. Oh, I think it was just like re-coronavirus and the idea of um, being a bit too loud about something that could go wrong. And Y2K is like kind of a joke now because this is, this is like when we hit the year 2000, a lot of old systems that run on a um, two-digit year-based system um, would implode because 
they couldn't handle the fact that we ticked over into a new century. Um, then the reason why it's perceived as a bit of a joke is that people took it seriously and fixed all the things that could have gone wrong. Um, so it didn't, there wasn't like a, a massive meltdown. Um, and oh god, I don't remember where I was going with this. I don't know why I'm so impassioned right now, but um, yeah, we haven't seen a lot of like huge technical problems that have brought the world to a halt, um, at least on like the scale of a pandemic <laughs> of coronavirus. Um, but I feel like it's only a matter of time. Like we, we've just patched stuff together. We've just been patching things together. Oh God, it's scary. Um, so yeah, I wanna live on the land, in nature. That's the, the only place to get away from all systems is through basically complete isolation. Uh, but just working, living on a farm, being able to provide for yourself and not being reliant on, on systems. Um, being part of them but not being reliant on them because like when we couldn't buy like food that was really scary and it, that wouldn't be an issue if you lived on a farm because you make the food yourself this has gone on long enough um this has been a video on the machine stops by em forster um i implore you to read it it's literally like 40 50 60 pages long of this tiny tiny book um and it's great and i would love to hear your opinions down in the comments about this or about any of the other random crap that I've gone on about in this video. <laughs> um, I'll see you soon for another one. Bye.